significance is right at the core of the planning system, but we do sometimes struggle with the vocabulary that's been handed down to us. Um, significance may mean one thing within the planning system, it may mean something slightly and slightly different uh, to um, a, 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 a PCC or to any of the other denominations. So the big question, I think, having reached this stage of our proceedings is to say, what does it actually mean for decision makers, whether it's the um, congregations, whether it's the DACs advising or even the chancellors in the Church of England um, reaching those very difficult and sometimes contentious, balanced decisions. So, we have to spark the, um, uh, to spark this session, we have, first of all, um, a contribution from John Scott, who reminds me that uh, we were tramping around the West Midlands about 35 years ago, so uh, um, what goes around come around. And John is going to present uh, for a joint paper um, with his uh, colleague uh, Christopher Stella. And then to um, balance the, uh, the program, we have um, a contribution from uh, Bridget Diaz, um, exploration of uh, statements of significance. And as I say, I think the key thing there is to recognise that it means different things to different people. So let's see if we can find uh, some common ground. And sent a shiver down my spine to see that uh, Bridget is going to share reflections from a PhD study. Um, those of you who've been through that trauma will know just how, uh, uh, how, how difficult it is sometimes to uh, pull out the really uh, key arguments that are best, uh, best, best aired in uh, this kind of session. So, with huge thanks to both our contributors, if I can begin first uh, by asking uh, John to um, tell us about his work, particularly for the Society, uh, Victorian Society in the South East, um, and uh, how statements of significance, value, and so on play into all the decision making that needs to take place in the uh, uh, in, in establishing the future um, of our historic places of worship. So, John, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. The group in this room today has a very sophisticated appreciation of the 19th century church. But um, this, an influential architectural guide for a generation at least, um, remains very pervasive. And I quote, Another revival of earlier styles took place in the 19th century, but without much success. The result is often quaint and sometimes charming, but it was not good architecture. You may guess that that's not the official view of the Victorian society, but perhaps it is subliminally, at least, in the mind of the church warden of this small rural church in Mid-Devon, which he described as, and I quote, a lovely medieval church completely ruined by the Victorians. There is an alternative interpretation of this building. It could be regarded as a gem of a complete church by Henry Woodyear, an architect of considerable reputation who applied his skills to design as a piece the building and all the fittings right down to the door furniture which is highlighted in the most current edition of Pevsner and who commissioned the best providers for the glass which is by Hardman and other craft input. Looked at in that light Woodyear selected the best features of an earlier building the font, the arcade capitals and the carved wall plates depicting green men and integrated them into his design. So here we have a church designed for 19th century forms of worship, a complete and integrated piece of design by a good architect and a community that does not recognise it as of cultural worth. <clears throat> On a more positive analysis than that of the Lady Bird books, one of the singular legacies of the 19th century is the parish church interior, small or large, that is this professionally designed, integrated whole. Architecture, fittings, glass, decoration, the whole piece. Moreover, it's not just the complete new churches of the period that achieve this unity of vision. More often than not, the buildings we see now are the result of 19th century restoration or reordering of earlier fabric, 
and many of these are no less unified and coherent in their character. The parish church interiors of England and Wales, I would propose to you, are collectively one of the most extraordinary collections of architectural, artistic and craft endeavour in the world. I challenge you here to make momentarily a mental co comparison with those of France. And it's a mystery to us while they, why they, the appreciation of some of them by those in whose care they rest seems to lag behind the more general reappraisal of other kinds of Victorian buildings. <coughs> but worst, we as a nation suspect the Victorians of sweeping away inconvenient earlier features, and indeed sometimes the sensibilities of an architect towards the heritage were overridden by the less sensitive intentions of his client. But often a careful appraisal was made of the best of the inheritance, and the Victorian design was prepared as a setting for and as a foil to it. The 19th century was the first era of professional design that did knowingly and analytically value the history of the building. The locality of the t t or the type, albeit through a Victorian lens that we would not now use. And both use fabric and take design cues from them with the objective of creating a coherent and beautiful new design. George Gilbert Scott's surviving letter to the vicar of this church sets out his thinking in doing just that. And I quote from, it's interesting that of one feature he says, and I quote, although I am aware that you consider this a defect, I cannot but view it as a point of interest, which it would be a pity to remove, and I would therefore strongly urge that this link to the history of the church be allowed to remain, which it did. The point here is not the differentiation of medieval and Victorian fabric, or speculation as to what earlier features failed to make the cut, it's that whether or not they've been starting from scratch, the 19th century architects have created a unified piece of design that's beautiful on their terms. They've used or retained features of various earlier periods and have rooted their own design work in the language of the building and its locality. Alongside the clarity of the 19th century liturgical agenda, which I will return to, it's perhaps this wholeness, this very integration, that makes them such a challenge for their users and keepers in a changing world. We're sometimes told that this legacy gives license to be as uncompromising as they were, and that in enabling diversification of use, we're returning our churches to an idyllic and perhaps mythical earlier period. All of this misses A, if not the, point. What we inherit now is very different from what the Victorians inherited then. We have to deal with what we have, and at the moment we seem to be prepared to risk irrevocably, and we would contend unnecessarily, degrading this collective treasure. The relatively unusual, if contentious, complete reordering of churches for huge and highly resourced worshipping communities to whom they're entirely unsuited is a challenge we're going to leave for a different presentation because the issues are usually so polarised that no satisfactory compromise can be achieved. Even some of the great set pieces of 19th century interior fittings are not in immune to sweeping intervention and there are two on the Victorian Society casework list at the moment. But the same issues emerge in smaller and superficially less contentious projects, and these can and will in time result in an equally damaging and much more widespread erosion of the historic character of our churches. This is not an argument that change should not take place, but it is a plea that it should be managed much better than it often is at the moment. What we are concerned with in this paper is the reordering, in whole or part, of interiors that owe their character to the work of the 19th century, usually with the intention of enabling diversification of liturgy and use, which will sustain the survival of the church in a community. What is most challenged by this is the character of the smaller parish church, like the one with which I started, but extending to buildings of lesser design pedigree, but equal charm. The atmosphere and character of many churches like this is clear, if intangible. It's also fragile, and it can be destroyed by small, well-intentioned but jarring interventions, just as completely as it can by wholesale reordering. We may not be able to reach that church warden, or indeed anyone adhering to the Lady Bird Book's commentary on architectural history, to convince him that he has in his care a top-notch 19th century church rather than what may have been a not very distinguished medieval one. So we should presumably look to the professionals and above all to the system to ensure a culture of greater respect 
for the 19th century contribution to church history. The Duffield Judgment, which sets out the framework under which we all now operate, makes it quite clear that the burden of proof of real need is very high to justify harm to heritage of significance. But this is often, in our view, sidestepped by an assertion that the heritage affected, taken in isolation, is not particularly significant, coupled with a very broad interpretation of need, and supported by church authorities willing to prioritise things other than heritage protection. If we're to manage our 19th century, or indeed any other heritage, in a more sensitive way, we have to achieve a culture and process in which assessments of significance are both objective and dispassionate. Many appear to be written to support decisions already taken, rather than being the first thing done and then used as a tool in making the decisions, as we all know they should be. How often is the appraisal of, but also burdened with antiquarian prejudice that leaves the 19th century layer undervalued. Inadequate assessments that regularly form the basis of decisions in the faculty system would, I would contend, not be accepted in the secular world of listed building consent. Some considerable discussion here has gone into the task of appraising the significance of pews and other features, and we would like to make the case for additionally assessing the character and significance of the whole. <coughs> Identifying what is and is not individually significant in order to cherry pick what should be retained or discarded can result in the unhappy neglect of the overall concept and character and the removal of lower status fittings that provide the context for the obviously higher status ones which are then left diminished by their less sympathetic context. It's rare that the Victorian society sees documents that appraise things by their contribution to the whole as well as by their individual merits even to the extent that George Gilbert Scott did at that Devon church I showed you earlier. It may be the sheer quantity of the 19th century work that clouds our corporate judgment. The individual pieces of an 18th century set of box pews are no more, and indeed often less, distinguished pieces of joinery than their 19th century equivalent, but they seem to be almost sacrosanct, whilst Victorian interiors are often seen to be up for grabs. Even 12,000 19th century interiors will be devalued stock if 11,500 of them have been messed up. We would put it to you that the majority of these church buildings are not as inimical to change, of use, the changes of use patterns, as they're often assumed to be. Let us be positive and look at how we might achieve a better result and even how we might learn from our 19th century forebears whose work appears to be such a challenge. We can start by valuing what we've inherited. Like Scott, Woodyer and their ilk, we can benefit today by looking at the features of any church interior as potential assets rather than as potential encumbrances. And I think that's actually different from what normally goes into a statement of significance. We can think more creatively about the ways in which good fittings can be embraced and given new or refreshed use rather than cast aside or treated as exhibits. If we allow it to do so, the building and the retained fittings can give order to our activities, as well as the activities imposing order on the building. Like them, we could design with the objective of perpetuating the best of the character in an interior that has it, and indeed of enhancing it where it doesn't. This could involve adaptation of existing fittings to new use. Possibilities include turning fixed pews into movable benches or moving some but not all of the seating and above all not treating pew retention versus pew removal as a binary question. And the Evesham case that the, um, was mentioned in, yesterday is I think a case in point to that. Alternatively it can involve the design and selection of new fittings in sympathy with their surroundings. Here, the introduction of purpose-designed movable benches allows the church to be used for a range of community activities, but reverting to an organised arrangement when in repose, maintaining the best of the historic character of the church. We can avoid, if we wish, introducing furniture that jars with the surroundings. If we deem the consistency or character of the building worthy of our attention, its survival will depend as much on what is added as on what is taken away. It should be a general principle that any new fittings are equal in quality to those that they replace, 
otherwise the interest and significance of our historic churches will steadily diminish. But that in itself will not make the intervention sensitive. Colour is often critical, as has been mentioned today, as is a recognition of the effect of less significant features on the appreciation of more significant ones. We could emulate our forebears in trying to make the practical beautiful. We might not want to raise every boot scraper to the dizzy architectural heights of this one by Pearson, but every little piece has the potential, if we choose, to contribute delight. The 19th century architect was designing for the practicality, just as is the architect of today, and often the most ingenious aspects of 19th century design are those which engage with a particular practical matter, as here, where the book rest acts as a lectern with the gate shut and as a priest stall desk with the gate open. What went with that, though, was a striving for order and beauty, admittedly of a Victorian sort, and it seems too often that that's no longer the same priority. The Victorian Society sees a lot of proposed alterations for churches, some 600 notifications last year. And the nature of the new work is more often than not utilitarian in design and domestic in character. Such interventions are typically very harsh on the design unity I've just been exploring. And if some features deemed significant, are even if some features deemed significant are retained as exhibits, it's often the realisation rather than the principle that poses the problem. It's surely not inevitable that we lose the numinous or even the atmospheric by affecting change. We can aim to replace order with order rather than substituting it with disorder. This complete reordering has involved the introduction of new movable benches in place of undistinguished, in this case, Victorian pews allowing some flexibility which has proved very liberating in terms of church use. But conversely here, the order of a previous liturgical era has been replaced with a character rather less at ease with the historic building around it. And even in the usual mode, the historic fittings that remain echo the fate of the historic assets in Osbert Lancaster's fictional town of Drainfleet, isolated and shorn of their context doesn't even need to be so comprehensive to be harmful. Here only about a third of the pews in this church have been removed to create flexible fellowship space at the back. But the rubbish that fills the space instead of the pews has a devastating effect of the, on the quality of the interior, which looking the other way is not at all bad. But the first thing you see is what, you, is what I showed you last. We can seriously scrutinise the all-consuming passion for flexibility. Few architectural challenges are greater than that of creating architecture out of multi-flexi space. To demand total flexibility just in case is also a lazy response. How often, if, how often, if at all, is it really essential to clear everything away? Is this really the right place to be doing the things which do require you to clear everything away? How much of the need is met by being able to move some rather than all of the furniture? And indeed, how much less harmful would that be? Above all, we conclude from the scrutiny of literally hundreds of cases a year at the Victorian Society that some 80% of the harm is caused by meeting perhaps the last 20% of the perceived need. And that with an adjustment to how we broker the compromise between the need and the constraints, we could, with imagination, sensitive design, and the empathy urged on us by one of yesterday's speakers, meet 80% of the need while causing 20% of the harm, and in doing so, largely avoid the conflict that too often goes with church reordering projects. That 80% may not enable every use that the community can dream up for the building, but we suggest that in most cases, it has a chance of enabling enough to sustain its survival in a community that recognises its value. Thank you. Well, John, thank you very much indeed. And I know that uh, you're joined now by uh, Christopher for the discussion session on, uh, on, on the thoughts that you've shared with us. 
I really want to open this up for um, a wide-ranging conversation, but I wonder whether we could alight on one point of agreement. You said absolutely that it was about the ensemble, it was about the overall character of a place, of a historic church, not just about the components that may be disposable or otherwise managed differently. Is that a strong sense within the, uh, within the room, that when we're talking about significance, it will be a sliding scale, but it's not just about a bag of bits, expendable or otherwise? Anybody got any reactions to that? I may be completely wrong. John? Well, it's certainly, it's certainly the position that, that we would want to put forward, yes. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry. the microphone there. Is that working? No. Sorry, I was... There's nothing happening here. Hello? Oh, there, there we are. are. <laughs> um, it's certainly the position that we, 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 we are seeking to put forward, yes. If, if I might use an analogy, I think the, um, the risk is if you look at a church as a Christmas pudding, uh, and you decide the important bits of the plums and you take them out, but what's left isn't much of the pudding. <laughs> any, any contrary thoughts? That it is... <clears throat> well, other questions then, um, for further um, uh, elaborating on the points that, uh, that John has, uh, has put forward, and Christopher, if you wouldn't mind chipping in uh, in answering some of the questions that uh, I'm sure we'll have from the floor. One in the middle there. There's a microphone coming your way. Hello, apologies to say to my voice. One word we haven't heard is minimalism. I think that the domestic fashion for minimalism must explain some of the, the absolutist design just have an all out clear out. Well, certainly as an organisation, we are agnostic on style and we certainly don't um, ask architects to design um, in the Gothic style. Um, and I can think of good examples of church reorderings uh, and bad examples in, in every style. Um, so I think we, we'd be very wary of insisting that people move away from minimalism. But I would say, I, I would add to that that um, I think that too often um, a rich interior is replaced by something bland. And that actually has to be, at some level, a design decision. Yes, please. It's coming from the right. Um, I, I, I wholly uh, agree with how you have just put it a moment ago that, if you like, it's the interior as a whole. Was it, you didn't use the word ambiance, but nearly did. Um, which gives the quality to our better churches. Um, the difficulty, the, the, the great difficulty which really this conference is all about, but slightly skirting round, is the fact we are dealing with people who want to change churches and are putting forward applications to do so. And there is a bit who are concerned with the process and decision have to weigh up a balance between, on the one hand, the significance or overall merit, on the honest, whatever, on the one hand, and the desires of a, a congregation who are usually very far from being architectural historians, but who want, or think they want, change. And the more negative <coughs> our own position, the more difficult the whole matter becomes. Because if you want, you have a congregation who got it into their heads that they want to have freer worship, i.e. they want to take out the views, 
because then they can set this up or do whatever. Um, and they say, can we do this? And to, to give them the answer, oh, well, it, it goes against the ambiance, is, is, is a difficult thing. <coughs> That's why. <I'm coughs> I mean, I prefer, for my part, um, the crucial thing there was to say whether there's an automatic association between understanding significance and the soul and the specifics of a decision that has to be taken because somebody is putting forward a proposal. Is that something that you've got examples of where perhaps the benefits of looking holistically to start with reap dividends further down the line? Um, I'm struggling to think of a specific example um, off the top of my head, but, but certainly I think whatever conclusion you come to, I think most people would agree that it's vital to start out with a good statement of significance. Um, and I, I struggle to see how complete clearance of, say, of cues from the nave could ever be justified if the alternatives, such as making them movable, such as removing some of them, haven't been considered. And that, that process of thought and options of phrase, if you like, is always something that we would look for. And I think that the, the idea that a desire for change is classified as a need is, is problematic. You know, needs, certainly in terms of the Duffield judgment, needs are things that you've actually got to be able to put your finger on. And the burden of proof that, that it is a need as opposed to an aspiration is in theory quite high. How you can attach a, well, we want to change it all, as a need, is, I think, very problematic. Are there examples? That's where we have tried in from earlier there. Yes, you have, the, you have the slot, and the microphone will be following over just behind the camera. Any minute. Uh, John and I have been chatting about this yesterday, actually, about how much that church is changing and the use of church was. I think it was purely needs based, no church would be born in a wooden shack ever. And it's all, it has been about aspiration, about desire, including all the Victorians in church buildings. And I think one thing that's worth actually considering and trying to take forward as an idea is are there actually situations where successful, probably charismatic, conservative evangelical churches, the way they want to use their building is so incompatible with an orphan, maybe a Victorian building, that they should do what they always tell us they want to do and actually go and get that industrial union and hand over the building of the Preservation Society. Because unfortunately, from the DAC's point of view, we're in between in this argument. And we say, no, you've got to keep your church. We can't be change it and so on. And it's a very fine balance to try and kind of keep both sides happy. And we're very much in the point of spot. Are there examples that others can share around the room? One at the back there. Yes, two people right, right at the back. Uh, can we uh, have the, the microphone go to the far corner near the coat rack? Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to thank uh, John Scott for a very interesting presentation, which different from our experience, but we entirely agree with. Um, we are concerned about, I agree with what Jeffrey Hunter said, often they maybe need to go to that warehouse. Um, we've had a, it's not a case from our period, it's actually just in the Victorian period of church about 1914. Which, where they wanted to walk away from their church. And we heard about this in North London. We heard about the church because a member had been lobbied by neighbours, afraid of what was going to go on the church site when they demolished it, because they were giving up that church to move into a warehouse or office premises where they thought they could continue their evangelization later. We want to avoid a stampede, we're not a stampede, churches, church congregations moving away from their churches, particularly 20th century ones, complete new churches which are generally held in low esteem, they have nothing medieval, they have nothing about setting or street or anything like that. But I think that the issue, we would say, we often have to prioritise our church casework with a lot of other pressing casework. Several people have given us support over number one poultry, a wonderful building by Sterling, which the Secretary of State ruled could not be listed because there was no threat. So we have many, many battles at the moment. But we look for fit ensemble, ensemble fittings, in the 20th century, often the designer or the church architect brought together many artists, both in the Catholic Church and the Anglican, less so than the non-conformists. And it's we are trying to identify an ensemble 
often we call it festive activities, not in the sense of the Church of England report, but they are where we really do want to preserve those fittings. And the example shown in my colleague Claire's presentation was St Paul's Harlow. They come with less baggage than the Victorian churches to some degree, because generally, oh yes, they're marvellous, they're great, these churches who will preserve them. But the problem is, is one problem is underlisting of these interiors, so we don't even have the leverage which listing gives. But I would say that we would look at complete ensembles of fittings where you have a pulpit and all these traditional features of the church, which are under threat by the evangelization train, and trying to preserve some of them. It's a process of deciding we'll let that one go, and we let many, many go. We have to. But some, we do dig our hills in and we say, no, this is, this is valuable, we should fight for this. And, uh, but uh, we don't have as many as 600 cases by any means, but it's increasing all the time. And the quality of some of the statements of significance and need we seek are just absolutely appallingly awful. Well, thank you. thank you so much for that really focused um, contribution. We did talk earlier, and I wonder whether you could perhaps put down a few thoughts as uh, a statement that we could share with um, uh, Diana as, uh, as the conference coordinator and organiser for this, so that your thoughts on behalf of the 20th Century Society are uh, um, fully understood and contribute to that, uh, that broader debate. Um, there was a, another question hovering right in the middle at the back, so I'm not quite sure where the microphone has gone. Put your hand, oh, you've got the microphone, well done. So, uh, uh, it's not so much a question, it's just wanting to pick up on the, uh, I think, slight caricature of, of uh, what is happening around uh, statements of need and so on. It, it is absolutely not the case that you can just put a statement of need and says, we want to change. You've got to specify something in the way of the sorts of activities you would anticipate doing in that change space. Um, and I, I, mean, I, I, I said earlier, I work for the Lots of Money Williams, but I also do case notes to the Ecclesiastical Law Journal. Now, they don't work as precedents, um, but nonetheless, people do pay attention to. The chancellors are very alive um, to the fact that if, if they don't apply the law properly, they may well get appealed. Um, and there, there is, there is, I think, a very conscientious attempt to um, preserve the integrity of churches and to find alternative solutions. I think of an example just off the top of my head, the case of Holy Trinity Horwich, where there was a hope to remove some Georgian pews, which were seen as um, uh, examples of socially graded pews. Now, I actually think there's a real theological issue about that, because what have socially graded pews got to do with, with Christianity? Um, but that's a uh, matter of life. The Chancellor refused the application and, and made several lots of suggestions about ways they could achieve the expansion of space without removing the pews. So I think it is unfair to caricature um, the, the, the state of the and the way that the Chancellor's exercised their judgment. So somewhere in there, the word proportionality uh, comes into play, and I hope that we are clear about the distinction between a statement of need and a statement of significance. Um, sorry, there was a comment. Uh, if, if I, I, I might, might line, line up three um, around the back there, very close. Who if, if I might respond to that one briefly, um, I think chancellors and DACs vary enormously throughout the country, and certainly there are many where their job of balancing is done in a very conscientious manner. Um, but I can also think of, of other examples, and um, the lack of consistency is a, big, is a big problem nationwide. And I can think of one case where the, um, the complete clearance of, of nave pews from a great star listed church was allowed on the basis of a combined statement of significance and need that was about 10 lines long, um, which the Chancellor concerned found perfectly acceptable. So, comment and question over there. Um, yeah, no, I would. Um certainly echo that. I think one of, the, one of the issues is the difference between theory and practice when it comes to these things. I mean, there is an enormous amount of very, very good guidance out there. You know, the Church Care website, for example, um, has you know, a whole series of guidance notes on assessing your pews and on you know, putting in extra features or writing statements of insignificance. Actually, you know, if that guidance isn't followed, then it may as well not be there. And I think actually, you know, DACs do vary, obviously, they don't all insist that such guidance is followed. And I think the real problem is, you know, when the push comes to shove, when it gets to a consistory court, it is 
you know, it is very easy for, as we heard yesterday from Charles George, actually, you know, for the balance to come down in favour of the parish getting what it wants if the way that argument is presented is, well, you know, we get what we want or we walk away, um, which is certainly what they would like. So, you know, if the guidance is followed, great. It, it certainly isn't all right. John and Christopher, any comments on that? All right, that clear statement of the uh, sequence. Now, there were a couple more at the back there. Um, the gentleman in a blue jumper needs a microphone. Thanks very much, uh, Trevor Cooper. Um, uh, two questions for the Victorian Society. Uh, to what extent do you give weight to the fact that the ICBS grant scheme in the 19th century encouraged gross over period? And to what extent do you give weight to the fact that significant architects, Arterfield, Pearson, uh, themselves are quite happy to put um, chairs in churches? Um, I think there are actually very few churches left which still retain their entire 19th century complement of pews. I would, in my experience, the vast majority there's been incremental removal over the years since then. Uh, and, and I think we're probably getting to the stage as if there are any which are still completely um, pewed to, to that um, almost sometimes ridiculous extent that then they're starting to have a real rarity value. <laughs> I, I, I think that's probably the case, but I, I can't think I can't think of a, of a Victorian society case that I've been aware of where the society has resisted any change and insisted on the retention of such an overpewed over overpewed interior. It's it's about how you do it and about this this question of ensemble and actually whether the pews contribute to the ensemble value of the interior and whether, in the case that they do contribute, whether there is a critical either area or quantity of pewing below which you can't drop without damaging that ensemble. And I think that there's, it's almost unimaginable to have a case except in a, in a sort of perfect um, perfectly preserved interior of enormous rarity that you would that it would be completely intolerant of removing for example pews some churches where you have pews which face east against a completely blank wall in the sort of north corner of the north transept which nobody in their right minds would want to sit in to worship that's not the issue I think there was one more at the back. Yes, Richard. Um, one thing uh, we try to do in at least is um, before parishes get stuck into states of significance, is we ask them to think about the character of the building. Uh, character, of course, is special character as part of the sort of, uh, the old fashioned way of doing this. Um, but character can bring into it those sort of things that uh, you don't have to be an architect historian to know about. You know, it's dark, or you know, um, it, the, the unwelcoming bit, you know, uh, and you can start to to see what they what's prompting the need for change, which is not always driven by a liturgical need. Um, or, or, or you know, a community need. It, it's sort of the, the atmosphere, the character of the building doesn't suit now. And it's not, not and too often the answer has been you know, the, to do something domestic, because that's what people know about. So it's, it's about carpet um, and uh, putting lots more, lots more lights um, to the point where you overlight the thing. And so, that and that's where on the, on the concept of thinking about the ensemble uh, as as an ensemble rather than individual bits or the architect or whatever can can lead can help the foundation lead into uh, understanding what they've got before they and, and what its deficiencies in their eyes at the moment are straightforward. And 
and significance and value in that sense can, is a place of worship. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to be very courageous and take two more questions on the strict understanding that they come off your lunch break now. One at the back there, um, just behind the, uh, the last desk. Can you see there's a hand up at the, at the back? And I promise uh, there's another one on the left, and then I think we need to move on to our next uh, contributor. Christine Anderson, Kisoko, the Church Buildings Council. Um, I'd just like to hear what the Victorian Society says in response to those people, and there are many of them out there, who assert that a partial removal of pews constitutes an unhappy compromise solution. Well, I think you have to judge every case on its merits, and, and there might well be some cases where that's true, and certainly I think there are cases where one or two token views have been kept um, sort of against the side, and it just seems like a meaningless gesture. Um, I, I think what we would always, what we would usually push for is for retention of a sort of critical mass of pews in the, um, in the central nave, perhaps, enough to give that sense of, um, of structure, which is often very important to the architecture. Um, but, but clearly that's going to need careful thought and design in every case, and there's no sort of template for every church. I'd like to add to that that um, Dale Deschamps' talk yesterday um, introduced us to the um, ecclesiologist's suggestion that you have two levels of seating in a church. You have, you have fixed bench seating in a part of the church where flexibility is not generally and where you are going to seat your every, every, t every time regular core users. But then you have a, a different sort of seating that offers different opportunities in other bits of the building. And I think that it, every case, case has to be taken on its merits, but that it's, it's all about understanding what's important about it. And that, and if a totality is what's important, then maybe a renewal of seating for the whole building can be can be the right solution. If if the character that the present seating gives, then I don't think that partial removal has to be looked at as a fudge. Now, one final question to the to the right of the hall where. Don't run, don't trip. Thank you. Um, this is more of a comment to support some of the um, uh, comments that we've had previously about change and change management. Um, in the museum sector, which is where I've uh, come from, about 20 years ago we used to have this discussion uh, about preservation versus access. And we've moved on from that now and realised that what we're actually dealing with is change management and how can we manage that change most effectively. Um, and what Jeffrey was just raising is the question of how do we manage that change on a practical basis. There's this really good book by uh, somebody called Stuart Brand, who nothing to do with ecclesiology, nothing to do with heritage at all. Um, he's, um, the book is uh, The Frog of the Long Now. And in that book, he's actually looking at how time affects our judgments. <coughs> and he has this diagram where he looks at Fashions, which are very short term and change very easily. Trends, I think some of the words that I've, I've heard being used throughout this conference is the fashionable, fashions being used or trends being used, which tend to be more long term. And then looking at cultural changes. One of the elements that um, we need to look at is how the things that we're doing with, how the needs and how the significances are changing over like the short term, over fashion or um, a longer trend or more of a cultural thing that's happening. And it's recognising these as to whether are we going to um, agree to changes that are actually going to be fashionable but then are going to go out of fashion? Or are we actually looking at cultural, um, cultural significant, significant changes in terms of cultural um, epochs, as it were? Um, but actually, we do need to look at how we're going to manage those carefully. I think one useful way of um, addressing that very important point would be to go back to the orderings that were done perhaps 10 or 15 years ago and talk to people about how they've worked, what has been successful, what kind of legacy they've left, 
and we, we, we too often don't have time to do that process of actually going back and seeing how these ideas have worked in practice. <coughs> well, thank you very much indeed to John and to Christopher for stimulating what I thought was really very productive genuine debate and uh, highlighting some of the uh, issues both for those who um, are contributing in one way or another to decision-making processes um, and those who um, are here to safeguard and promote that fusion between the quality of environment, of place in which worship takes place, and the uh, 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 pattern of um, scholarly endeavour that goes into establishing precisely what those vital ingredients are. So thank you very much indeed to John and Christopher. Can I ask David now to do that? So Bridget has the uh, unenviable task, I know, of sharing with 